gasped for air after ducking behind a stalagmite to escape the unnerving gaze of the creature. As you take a moment to assess your situation, a giant eye opens up from the curve of wall across from you, and once more you are forced into a roll to avoid the deadly ray which instead disintegrates the rock formation you were crouched behind. You look around to see your friends scattered, one of them a bloody heap upon the ground. He screams in agony as your cleric attempts to call forth holy energy to heal him, but the central eye is upon them, preventing any magic from being cast. You take a deep breath to steady your hands and run in as soon as you see an opportunity, knowing the fate of your party rests upon your shoulders. You leap into the air and in a moment of desperation release your spear with absolute precision and watch as it sails to meet its mark. The beholder hits the ground with a resounding boom and the cave around you shudders, as if breathing a sigh of relief. Then, silence. Creeping slowly down the echoey tunnel, deeper and deeper beneath the surface of the earth, you stop abruptly as one of your party members trips over the uneven ground and swears under their breath. A rock dislodges from beneath their boot and skitters forward, and you raise a finger to your lips, glaring menacingly at the tall human, even though he probably can't see you in the intense darkness. Continuing on, you come across the rotting carcass of some unfortunate rodent, the smell so pungent your eyes begin to water. Suddenly, two hands with long, spindly fingers reach out and wrap themselves around your throat. You thrash violently, trying to loosen their grasp, but to no avail. Each time you try to draw in a breath, the hands seem to tighten, but just before the last remnant of oxygen leaves your lungs, the hands are ripped from you, and the creature lets out a bone-chilling howl that ends abruptly as one of your companions grinds their heel into its fleshy, writhing form. Dungeon Diving with Grace and Erica. Welcome to episode two, and thank you guys so much for listening to our very first episode. That was a wild ride. <laughs> uh, so before we get started this week, we'd like to thank a bunch of people um, who helped us with the first episode and just helped us get started or were amazing people. Uh, the first one of those is our dear friend Christian Brooks, who helped us with the logo. Uh, he did an amazing job, and we're very, very happy to call him our friend. Then also we'd like to thank our music guy, uh, Bradley Parsons. And so now we have some solid intro and outro and transition music. Then also uh, Grace's dad really helped us get some good equipment so that we can actually produce, you know, quality stuff at least. Uh, <laughs> maybe not content-wise, but at least it sounds good. <laughs> And then finally, we'd like to thank everyone on social media who listened and gave us your feedback. Uh, we wouldn't be doing a second one if we hadn't gotten some good responses. Yes, so true, true. Hopefully you will continue to enjoy the show and we will continue to produce it. Woohoo! This week, as we discussed last week, we're going to be talking about aberrations and the sort. Um, again, oh. our normal um, little, what's it called, format, our format is typically um, commonly used, and then we give our little sales pitch for our uncommonly used ones, and then you guys get to decide uh, which ones are your favorites. Last week, it seems like our favorite of the of the bunch was Blink Dogs. Because they're fantastic and good boys. Yeah, um, and our favorite response was that you can use them in roleplay Santa blinking across if you want the world. <laughs> If you want to find that response, you can check out our Twitter, which is at dungeon underscore diving. Uh, and then you can also chime in each week about your opinion on your favorite creature. Woohoo! Okay, so now we're going to dive into it, as we have discussed before. As we already said. As we've said, yes. But now we're like actually going to like put on our scuba gear and like get in there. I hate you. Into the nitty gritty. So we're talking about beholders first this week, and uh, I think the thing to say... <laughs> about beholders is that they're perfect uh you don't need to change anything about them they're the best design monster in the entire monster manual and that's it (laughs) no incorrect there's so much that you can do with beholders uh i feel that i a lot of people have really 
done. So a lot of the times when I see beholders in games, they're often used uh, uh, as, oh no. uh, I almost sneezed, as um, like these big bads, um, like the final end boss, as you've heard in our like intro piece um, mm-hmm. on beholders. Um, they're usually like the climax of like, you know, most battles, or even some campaigns, like, Beholders are, like, the end game, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think they do work really well for that, just because... They're scary. They're, they're big, scary boys. <laughs> uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar with D&D, Beholders are basically a giant, gross eyeball uh, that floats in the air and has about ten other tiny eyeballs uh, on these, like, stalks sticking out of it. Yeah. So, oh, and they also have a big mouth full of spiky teeth. Yeah, so terrifying in, in theory, terrifying. Yes, um, but uh, yeah, but um, there's a lot of I feel like fun ways that you can implement them, and especially in like high level campaigns. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had previously discussed that beholders. Well, something that I realized was mm-hmm. that beholders are lawful evil. Mm-hmm. And you could really play to that by making them, um, how do I put this, like, a part of society that aren't good people. Some some sort of, like, corrupt aspect of society. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe they run the city watch mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, you have a really dangerous police force that, uh, doesn't exactly look out for the people of a city yeah something like that i think that'd be really fun to play too Mm -hmm. um another thing i think just keeping that sort of lawful aspect in mind beholders are really able to be a part of a society in a way you know maybe most people wouldn't be thrilled about hearing that a beholder was a, a major part but you know they could be running a secret spy network or that sort of thing. Um, Didn't you mention about, like, an underground bar or something like yeah. that run by a beholder? Yeah, so I played in a uh, space D&D campaign where we were traveling across, like, the Astral Sea and stuff, which was amazing. Um, and one of the, like, main locations where we would go to, to we were kind of playing, like, not pirates, um, but pirates. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> space pirates. Space pirates. And one of the things that we did was we would go to this bar that was run by a beholder. And I'm pretty sure the name of the bar was the Eye of the Beholder, which... Ooh, that's good. It, it's so good. That's a good name. <laughs> um, and the beholder who ran it was basically an information broker. And so we would get a lot of our jobs from him basically going say like, hey, what have you heard? And the beholder would be like, oh, you know, there's a, <laughs> like, there's a ship stranded over in this area. Or we heard that there was a battle between these two uh, nations, and there's probably oh, some debris floating around really that cool. you could, like, ransack. Wow. I want to play in that campaign. It was really cool, and I'm really sad that we're not continuing it. <laughs> Another idea that would be super awesome would be, like, a beholder that plays pranks. I mean, have you seen their stats? They're like, they're like nuts. They're they're really like, like a player wet rolled really really well mm-hmm. on their stats. Mm-hmm. So you could have like an arcane trickster beholder, I think, and that would be a lot of fun. I think for a lot of I mean, a lot of monsters in general, I, beholders are I think they're challenge rating thirteen and then fourteen in their lair. If you want to make it so that you know higher level players can go up against this beholder. Um, like a full party of, you know, 17 or whatever. Whoa. Not 17 people, level 17. Yes. That's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you want to do that, you can just make the beholder also be a spellcaster. Or give them some, you know, additional legendary actions or that sort of thing. It'd be really cool if, like, if you could, like, when you play a beholder, you know how they have that ability where when they look over people, um, you can't cast magic. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool if you added a legendary action where you could, like, steal one of your player's spell slots Ooh. and cast, like, using their spells uh, if they're in, like, the vicinity of the eyeball. That would be really cool. Yeah. Actually, I really like that idea. <laughs> That's 
horrible yeah, and wonderful at the same super time. super great. But if um, something big and scary like a beholder isn't your, like, big fancy, there's also variants of beholders that you can use mm-hmm. um, that are, we, we call them lesser beholders. Um, only, they, they're like little baby beholders. Yeah, just because they come from beholders. Um, beholders are naturally a very paranoid kind of monster. Mm-hmm. And from that paranoia, other beholders somehow, like, basically like leech off of them you know not they, leech, they, like, like manifest yeah, essentially yeah. like um a death kiss which is a great concept yeah they're I... they're like these floating white balls with like spiky tentacle things um it's like an albino beholder yeah that's actually i don't think i've ever seen a death kiss in a game that i've been in it's one of those ones where I think maybe people struggle to come up with a way it's a to put it one. in. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really cool, and you don't necessarily have to come up with some amazing flavoring or, like, excuse to put it in there. Those are the kinds of things where, you know, if a beholder is kind of a big bad that you have coming up, a sort of mini boss or something like that could be a death kiss you know, that they run into on their way through the tunnels or... It could be a lieutenant for the city watch. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but they're like, um, they're basically like me. They're super paranoid about dying, um, and they live off of blood, which helps fuel like an electrical current in them. Um, and if they're seen in like low light settings, they can also be mistaken for a beholder. So playing to that could be really, 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 really scary. Oh yeah, if you have like some low level characters mm-hmm. who are experienced D and D players. And they see something off in the distance that looks like a beholder, and they're just like, no, no, we can't. Not like this. But really, it's just the death kiss. Um, So, yeah. So another thing we were going to talk about, or another two things, were gazers and spectators, which are, again, like, little little mini beholder babies. Um, And they have some of the same abilities as a beholder, but they are slightly different. Gazers have some rays that they can shoot out, but they're... Pew pew, <laughs> but they're uh, they're not as powerful, and they, you know, probably won't outright kill you the way a beholders tend to do. Probably, probably, yeah. And spectators are uh, challenge rating level three, so you can actually put these in um, some earlier level uh, games. Just as like um, the, the way I like to use them, as it describes in the D and D book. Um, is spectators are often guardians for, like, tombs or, like, something that their summoner summoned them for, for mm-hmm. uh, specifically 101 years. So that's something, that, this is just another jumping off point. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> uh, a lot of sort of mythical stories and that sort of thing will have things like an agreement that lasts for a year and a day or 101 years. And I really love that whole just the vibe of something being you know an agreement for this amount of time plus one it just it fits by it just feels really cool and makes it seem more important to yeah me. using non uh like numbers that aren't derived off of five and zeros tends to mm-hmm. make things spookier for whatever reason for whatever reason um but yeah spectators are used as guardians of like magical things Mm-hmm. So playing to that for a campaign where you're like, I don't know, running, wink, wink, a like tomb of, of sands or some sort, and you just what? have a like a sand campaign. Were, were we gonna talk about sand at some point? Oh, maybe maybe next week. Whoa, whoa. Um, but yeah, having having a spectator like watch over some like old runes or, or really anything um would be really cool and then you can kind of implement the summoner as maybe even like a big bad in, in, wherever they're going wherever the players are going mm-hmm. yeah things like spectators and gazers and honestly in my opinion even death kiss um they don't necessarily need to be tied directly to a beholder even though they are these sort of offshoots they can be summoned by other things they do have their own personalities and possibly their own goals and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So just because a death kiss manifested from this beholder doesn't mean that it's a minion of that one. You know, maybe it wants to make its own way in the world and move to New York and become a star. Yeah. Whatever you want. <laughs> Our next thing on the list, which is mind flares. Mind flares! Mind flares! Yeah. 
for those of you who are unfamiliar with mind flayers, they basically look like uh, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean, Not but yet. with like four tentacles instead of a whole beard. And there's no barnacles growing off of them. Uh, there could be if you want. You just have a, a whole room full of Davy Jones. I love this idea. Um, I don't. <laughs> But basically, they usually have about four tentacles uh, instead of the beard. But I really like the idea of them just having so many face tentacles because that's how I usually picture them in my mind. Four seems like a weird number for them to have. Personal opinion. You can disagree. Yeah. Um, I also like to imagine them as those, um, I don't know if you ever watched Doctor Who, but there's like those tentacle things and they hold their brains in their hands and they communicate like that and they're like slaves basically. I think having mind flares as slaves would be very interesting. Especially interesting because I think mind flares are known as being slavers in most lore. Mm. They have, like, this hive mind, so they're able to work together really well. Um, just because they're able to communicate psionically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in most of the most of the written lore published by, like, Wiz- Wizards of the Coast and that sort of thing, they enslaved the gith races so there's gith yankee and gith sarai and i never remember the difference but basically uh they a lot of them you know centuries ago in the lore were captured and enslaved and uh now there's an eternal war between the gith and the mind flayers but also between the gith sarai and the gith yankee so it's a it's a fun little thing there that you can play with I think one thing that um, also needs to be touched upon that maybe um, you Dungeoneers can put into your games is, like, how Mind Flare society is run. Um, You know, maybe there's, like, maybe Mind Flayers are matriarchal. Maybe they're patriarchal. We just don't know. Uh, It doesn't really say anything in the book, so kind of um, express yourself creatively through that. Maybe Mm -hmm. uh, Mind Flayers and Beholders work together, and then the corrupt... Uh, police force of you know beholder land are trying to take over the mind flares i don't know something like that yeah i uh, think one of the things we're trying to say is you know don't get stuck on maybe doing things exactly the way it's written in the books you can have an entirely different society than like what's described in Faerun and that sort of thing mm-hmm. you can do what you want maybe you know mind flares are a really common race to have and so you're player characters want to be mind players um and you can totally incorporate that that being said some mind players also aren't connected to like a hive mind kind of brain so you can have Mm -hmm. independent mind players as well uh one thing also um i think that we need to talk about when we're talking about mind players is the elder brain uh because first of all really cool concept but also there's not a lot of details or description published uh that really explains what happens if an elder brain dies um and so i think it could be really cool to you know if your players kill an elder brain or something like that or stumble upon sort of the remnants of a mind player (laughs) society after the elder brain dies it could be it could lead to some really cool situations and some really interesting character development hippie mind players what hippie mind flares where they were like yeah man like we really didn't want to have like anything to do with that elder brain but like i don't know we were just kind of compelled because they were just so charismatic you know what i mean i hate everything about that but it's so good (laughs) that's the point of creativity you can't you can't oppress me like this erica so anyways i think it's time to move on (laughs) okay your dreams be dreams kids don't let your dreams be memes kids am i selling first yeah okay let me go put on my tie uh i'll count you in sure okay ready on go on go uh one two three go burbalings are super great monsters that look like bat creatures and you can use them to tell your characters that you have a prophecy for them without actually (sighs) telling them that you have a prophecy for them yep that's it? That's all you wanted to say? That's the main reason that you can use them really well. But I think the coolest thing about Burbalings is that they can plane travel. Like, they can travel to different planes. And so can their clones. So what mm. what Burbalings are usually meant to like be used for is 
to gather information. They're basically like you 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 talked about with like your beholder before, um, information brokers. So they learn of like the dirty secrets about gods. They learn the dirty secrets about devils, and they don't have to like leave the comfort of their own home from it because they can make like a clone of themselves, send that clone to other planes, and then learn information by being sneaky little guys there. It's almost like you've used a burbling before. For specifically this scenario. No. The prophecy seemed a little too close to home. I don't know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. Erica. I'm it not can't... in the campaign you're currently running. No. It's not like you have a prophecy in my campaign that was told to you by a Burbling. Technically, the Burbling did not tell us the prophecy. Yeah, because you kept trying to kill it. It was it was a Burbling. Of course we were trying to kill it. Well, there you go, people. Learn how to use your Burbling so that... Your players don't try to kill it when you're trying to tell them a prophecy. Although it is really funny how frustrated we were to not get the prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's fine. Point is, Burbalangs are these super cool, like, underground spy kind of things, and you can really use them so that your players can learn some, like, big, dirty secrets about gods and, like, demons and devils and stuff, because these guys are supposed to, like, know everything about... Mm anyone they're the gossip girl (laughs) of the D &D world yeah so is there anything else you want to add about burblings not really no that's it i mean i think that should be cool enough as it is they do sound pretty rad and it's it's the kind of thing that i would like to use in a campaign maybe maybe i'll run a D &D campaign and just use burbling only burbling okay (laughs) all right so is it my turn it is your turn oh boy 15 seconds on the clock soon hold on all right okay ready one, two, three, go. All right, so I'm going to be talking to you about slads. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's actually pronounced slads, but I think slads is funnier, so that's what I call them. Uh, there are a variety of these bad boys, and I think the most interesting thing about them is the way they reproduce. Uh, they either lay eggs in you or give you a disease. Okay, that's time. <laughs> Please elaborate. <laughs> uh, so there are, mm, I think, five different kinds of slad. Or technically, the plural wow, of slad, slad is slatty. But really? Yeah, but yes, I think it's... that's a slatty. <laughs> um, but anyways, there, oh, there are God. a few of them. Do you know how many bards are just going to be like, yes, slatty, as they're killing a slad? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I ruined your whole sales what pitch. Have you done? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they're... Four or five different kinds. There's like death, gray, blue, green, and red, or something like that. Ooh, whole rainbow. <laughs> yeah, I, my <laughs> death, favorite color is death. Color. <laughs> uh, and they each sort of have different <laughs> abilities. Uh, I don't remember exactly what all of them are. I think green are like spellcasters for the most part. Um, so wait, are these like humanoid creatures? That no, they're still aberrations. Uh, some of them A can humanoid aberration. <laughs> no. Uh, let me, let me pull up a picture so I can kind of describe what they look like. Uh, they're gross. Mostly. Thank you. Thank you for that. They, they look like, like, lizard people. Or, or like, they frog like people with claws. People. Yeah, they're not pretty. Um, but some of them can, uh, polymorph themselves. And most of them start, not most, but a lot of them started out as humanoids of some sort that were then infected and because of the disease were turned yeah. into slotty well you know eggs they do that to you uh, so the eggs are a separate thing oh. that one is even cooler in my opinion there are certain slotty i think i want to say it's the blue ones but it might be the red ones uh where if they scratch you i think it is i don't know i think it should be the bite because like transfer of fluids is important for, you know, yeah, infections. Yeah, but it's like a zombie thing, you know? Yeah, I guess. Um, you can do whatever you want yeah. as a DM. Yes. Uh, but basically, one type of slad can lay an egg in you when it attacks you, and then that egg turns into a tadpole, or tadpole, that's how you pronounce that, and makes its way into your chest cavity. Uh, oh, so it's like Predator. Yes? I haven't seen Predator. Or... Alien? No, Predator. I think. I think it's Predator. No, Ah. Alien. It's Alien. Oh my god, I'll take your word for it. (laughs) 
Uh, but basically, then over the course of about three months, it grows inside the character's chest cavity. Uh, and if you haven't found it and, you know, killed it by then, uh, within the course of one round, it eats its way out of your chest and murders your character immediately and turns into a full-grown sled. Wow. And that, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone in between or beyond, is why Slatty are great. Yes, Slatty. Stop it. <laughs> but um, I think I think mostly they're really fun just because there is so much variety to them, and also because there's sort of the consequences later on of having fought them and like maybe not having been successful in your fight against them. Now, here's a question for you. Can you raise a tadpole that has burst out of your friend's chest? You can you certainly think? try. <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I would love to see a player attempt to do that. I, 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 as a player, would totally nurture and raise this thing as my own, naming it after the character that it burst out of. You wouldn't try and resurrect the character that died? Well, that too. But hey, like, are you sure? No. No. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Alright, what's uh what's the next one that you're talking about? Um, you have to give me like five minutes to prep because this name is a mouthful. Oh boy. One, two, three, go. It's ick 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 zigzag. black and loud. So there's this really complicated name that I can't pronounce. I don't know if I still have fifteen seconds to do this. But they're no. basically... <laughs> Alright, that's my whole thing. <laughs> You're done. That's it. <laughs> Tell me more about them. I'm curious. Just the okay, name. So the name is pronounced... Ixitzachital. I can't say it. It might be no, pronounced No, it, it's in the official book. That's how it's pronounced. Hmm. Ixitzachital. Um, I can't say it that fast because... I don't know why. I'm not good at it. It's It's got more x's than it should yeah and it's a, a little confusing but these guys are basically like these manta ray looking things and they have these barbed tails and they live in like the deep sea um did they kill steve Irwin? i mean maybe that's why your players are looking for it <laughs> they were all big fans of the crocodile yep, hunter you know it's that's just how it be sometimes but anyway, please tell me more. <laughs> so these guys are, are, like I said, they're like these manta ray things. Um, and they're like, obviously they're aberrations, so they look like these monsters. But what like really interested me about it was the fact that these creatures, uh, even though like by themselves they are one fourth challenge reading, which is not super hard, mm -hmm. they have these variations, and one of them is a cleric. Ooh. So a manta ray cleric, which you can use in your campaign underwater, which is just the most interesting thing, I think, to have a manta ray cleric. I think another really cool thing about these clerics is that um, they have charm person as a spell, hmm. and they speak abyssal, so like this manta ray can talk to you, and it can charm you. It can charm the pants off of you. Hey -o. But yeah. If any of your bards are really into monsters. <laughs> Aren't bards into everything? Not necessarily. Mm. Not the bard I'm currently playing. Mm. I don't believe it. <laughs> That's my very short pitch. I just thought that this was a very interesting monster. Um, worthy about bringing up. And maybe even using in your campaign as a, like, cleric of Cthulhu. That would be wild. A manta ray as a cleric of Cthulhu. There's also a vampiric variant of this, which is less cool. It's still cool. Yeah, but, like, can you imagine a manta ray cleric with, like, a mace on its tail? And it can just bonk you over the head and charm person you? I think you and I have very different ideas about the type of campaigns we like to do. <laughs> Yours sound hilarious. Yes. I'm more like, mm. <laughs> I like D&D. &D. 
as a very serious game if in I'm a serious <laughs> world, okay? If my anxiety isn't through the roof about my character possibly dying, am I even playing D&D? Okay, but you can do that and still make it hilarious. That's true. That's like fair. me. Hmm. If you throw a manta ray cleric at me, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna do it then. Hurry up and sell me. Is it my turn? It's your turn. All right. Let me take out oh, my handy dandy primer. Handy dandy notebook. Okay, Is ready? this Blue's Clues? No. Ready? Yes. One, two, three, go. So I'm going to talk to you kinky people out there about chokers. Uh, not the, well, I was going to say not the kind that go around your neck, but it is the kind that goes around your neck, just <laughs> in a very dangerous, unhappy way. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I was drinking coffee. I'm not sorry. <laughs> um... Tell me more! <laughs> I'm intrigued! <laughs> so basically, chokers are very low-level aberrations. I just gotta say, before you go into it, I think you win this week's... <laughs> this... This sell. Thank you. Uh, very low-level aberrations. Uh, not a lot of hit points and that sort of thing, but they're... They're very interesting. Uh, they have a few abilities that make them super weird, and therefore wonderful. Actually, Choker was uh, one of our little intro bits um, that was it was described in that in that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, they are usually trappers, just because they're not very strong. They rely on like stealth and surprise. They're also ugly. They're super ugly. Uh, they picture a tiny green man with a weird head. And starfish, <laughs> and starfish for its hands and feet that have little spikes on them. Underwater leprechaun? Terrifying underwater leprechaun. <laughs> uh, no beard though, unfortunately, and uh, its pot of gold is more likely to be, you know, the carcass of some creature that it killed. Wow, oh, exciting. Uh, yeah, it's a good time, and also, so they generally are more solo, but. It said that, you know, where you find one, you will probably find others, just because they kind of go to similar hunting grounds, uh, and they can let out a very horrible, uh, like, loud keening howl to yeah. alert the other ones in the area. No, Ooh. not like a cute little kitten. <laughs> <laughs> not not that. No. Uh, more like a screech sort of thing. Oh, so they really are the kinkiest of the aberrations. Yes. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> You thought the tentacle monsters were here for that. Nope, it's the Choker. Literally named Choker. Yep. Uh, but anyways, they uh, they surprise you and they try to strangle you until you die so that they can eat you. Also, they don't have bones. They have cartilage so they can <gasps> move through tiny spaces. So kind of cool. like an octopus. Yep. Anyways, they're fun and I highly recommend them. Can you imagine if you're like in a creature hunting campaign? Kind of like... Um, fantastic beasts you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then you have to find a choker and you put it in like your little box and then it just squeezes out from like the cracks of your little box and then you have to fight it all over again yeah it would be terrible but also so entertaining to catch your players off guard that's a that's a really good idea erica mm -hmm. thanks i'm gonna be prepared when you <laughs> set us against a choker <laughs> i'm just saying will you it'll howl out yes slatty and then a bunch of slads are gonna come out. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> you don't have a choice. All right, so moving on. Yes. So we've decided to change our our weekly uh, highlight to highlight of the week instead of creature of the week. Partially because uh, one really excellent podcast titled Myths and Legends mm -hmm. already does a creature of the week thing. Go check them out. They're, it's it's a good podcast. Oh, yeah. Ten out of ten. Uh, but also because we're not always just going to be talking about creatures. Sometimes we're going to be talking about, you know, fun magic items or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. D interesting settings and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so highlight of the week instead of creature of the week. Yes. And this week's highlight is, um, the intellect devourer. Which is a tiny brain with spiky spider legs yeah it's like that prank that you'd play on someone and look and you know you'd like put your hand on their head and you're like 
ooh, I've got a brain eater, but it's starving. It's the same idea with an intellect devourer, except it won't starve. It, it will eat you. Yeah. It will devour your intellect. Yes, and what's even better is if it successfully devours your intellect, your characters, um, whoever's being devoured, um, their intellect will drop down to, what, ne- two? Zero. Oh, zero. Actually zero. Yeah, so they'll just become a vegetable, like a zombie vegetable. And then the intellect devourer goes inside your brain and controls your body. So it'd be really fun putting that in a campaign. I just, yeah, basically it would. I really like the idea. I mean, people use doppelgangers all the time to, like, swap out a character, but I think it would be so funny to have it be an intellect devourer. You know how I imagine an intellect devourer? Um, have you seen uh, Men in Black? Yeah, which which one? The first one. Mm-hmm. And you know how the alien who comes down and takes over that angry farmer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's how I imagine an intellect devourer would be like. Yeah, no, I see that. That makes sense. But yeah, so if you agree with our highlight of the week, please let us know. Again, we're going to post a little poll on Twitter to see which of the unusual creatures we talked about this week was the fan favorite. Uh, so if you feel like chiming in, again, it's at dungeon underscore diving. Oh, also, we would love to mention that once we hit 50 followers on there, we're going to be doing a little bit of a giveaway for dice. Yes, we will give you more details about that once we get to that point, but uh, it should be a good time. Yes, go follow us. All right. Well, I think that um, we're pretty much good to wrap up here. Anything else you would like to talk about, Miss Miss Erica? Uh, no, Grace, but thank you for asking. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Of course. So, one thing is, next week we're going to be talking about monsters you you can find in the sands. Um, Like desert monsters? Yeah, like desert monsters. Wow. We feel as if there's not enough campaigns that are, like, in the sand. I think, well, I'll wait. I'll save my opinions for the next podcast. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, it should be a fun time, and we've got some opinions to share, so tune in next week. Yes, and as always, let us know what your favorite monster from this episode was and what you would like to hear about for next week. And uh, I think think that's everything. Yeah. All right, so you guys have a great week, and we can't wait to hear your feedback again. See you next Tuesday. (laughs) Bye. Hi guys, it's Grace. One last note, we're currently working on making a studio, so bear with us with the mediocre audio until we get that done. Um, But until then, we hope you at least enjoy the content of what we talk about, and thanks for tuning in.